We're continuing our series of sermons on the spirit of man. This is part number eight. And uh, I, I, I wrote this outline this afternoon or this morning. And I'm really excited to teach it to you because God has been speaking to my heart about this very subject all week with regards to my political campaign. And I really think this is going to be a help to every person here with what you're going through. Not necessarily with what I'm going through, but with what you're going through. All right, Acts chapter 6, we're going to start reading in verse number 8. And we're going to go down to the end of the chapter. Acts chapter 6, and I'll look down at verse number 8. It says, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then... There arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians, and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and Asia, and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then they suburned men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses, which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council looking steadfastly on him saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. All right, so verse number 10 is my focus this evening. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here this evening. I love you, Lord. Holy Spirit, give me your power. Help me to preach with your, with the Holy Ghost upon me. Help me to have the mind of Christ so I can say exactly what you once said. I pray, dear Lord, also, Father, for um, everyone here to have ears to hear, a heart to receive, and a mind to comprehend. And Father, please do a work that only you can do, and we'll give you all the glory. Bless those who are watching online in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Jerry, did you happen to take attendance tonight? And uh, did you? No, uh, uh, Brother Zach, if you're up there listening to me, get attendance before, you, before the service ends, please. All right, um, so uh, if you look here, this is part number eight on the spirit of man, and the title of my message is The Wisdom and the Spirit by Which He Spake. So in verse number, number uh, 10, it says they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit of by which he spake. So, listen to this carefully now. Th do you hear me, Brother Zach? Thank you, sir. If you, um, if you do anything for God or stand for right, listen to the statement, you will face conflict, criticism, opposition, etc. Please don't miss this now because I'm laying the foundation for the whole sermon. If you do anything for God or if you just stand for right, whether it be at work, in your family, among friends, in government, at the church. I mean, just whatever. If you do anything for God or stand for right, you will face conflict, criticism, opposition, etc. Now listen to the statement. Don't forget this. How you respond will greatly determine the outcome. How you respond will greatly determine the outcome. Let's look at three words and give you definitions of the words in verse 10. Look what it says in verse 10. And they were not able to resist. Write down the word resist, and here's what this means. Stand against or oppose. They weren't able to resist what he said. Here it was, Stephen did many wonders and miracles, it says in verse 8, among the people. And then in verse 9, it says there arose certain of the synagogue and people disputing with Stephen. And it says they were not able to resist. That means they couldn't come up with a with a, a position to stand against what he was saying. So in other words, he took the legs out from under him. That's what it meant. He took the legs out from under him. So that's what the word resist, uh, stand against or oppose. Next word, wisdom. Look, at, look what it says. It says, and they were not able to resist the wisdom. And again, the word wisdom here is not talking about seeing life from God's point of view. The word wisdom is talking about discretion, sound judgment, and wit. Discretion sound judgment and wit. So 
Stephen had a sound argument when they disputed with him, and they were unable to resist his wisdom. The third word that, that is what we're also going to mainly focus on tonight, it goes this, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. The third word I'm going to give you a definition for is the word spirit. And I taught you this, I think, seven weeks ago, but we're going to give it to you again. The word spirit means attitude, outlook, disposition, demeanor. All right? Attitude, outlook, disposition, and demeanor. All right? So what it says there is this. They were unable to stand against the wisdom that he spake and the demeanor or um, disposition that he had. Okay, so there are two things. When conflict came to Stephen, he relied upon wisdom and he relied upon spirit. And, and it was so good, the wisdom that he had and the spirit that he had, that it absolutely cut the legs out from underneath those that disputed against him. All week long, as I read this, I think, let's see, um, I can't remember what day I read this, but I think it was either Tuesday or Wednesday I read this passage. And ever since then, I've been thinking, I've been praying dozens of times to God throughout the days and throughout the week, Lord, make me like Stephen in my political adventure. Help me to have the wisdom and the spirit that they are unable to resist me, resist what I say and my attitude. And so as a politician, as a pastor, as whatever it is, I'm standing for God, standing for right, I want to project myself and portray myself as a man of wisdom and a man who has a spirit that even though people oppose me, they disagree with me, they are unable to resist what I'm saying because of wisdom and because of my spirit. Now listen just carefully. We all, in our battles with conflict, criticism, and opposition, no matter where you're at in your life, we all should want to present ourselves like Stephen did. Let me give you a thought, and then uh, I'm going to give you five points after this. This is all introduction. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3, a familiar verse. 1 Peter chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 12 through 17. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. Again, this is this is familiar territory. I'm not giving you a passage that we haven't preached from recently, but it's, it's appropriate for this lesson. First Corinthians, I'm sorry, First Peter chapter 3, verse 12. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you? If ye be followers of that which is good, but, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be, be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience, now watch this now, that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better... If the will of God be so that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. All right, so here's Stephen. Now, he ended up suffering, right? I mean, he ended up getting stoned. The people, the, uh, after he preached in Acts chapter 7, um, he, they ended up stoning him to death. So, I mean, obviously, he suffered for well-doing. But it says right there, uh, happy are ye if ye suffer for righteousness' sake. And then it, and then it goes on to say, uh, in that passage, let's see here, I just lost it first. Here we go. It says, it says that whereas they speak evil of you uh, uh, as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. So how is it that if they speak falsely about you as an evildoer, but they're ashamed when they do it? It's because you have wisdom and the right spirit, just like Stephen had. And so this ought to be our goal. We want to have the wisdom and the spirit like Stephen had because they were unable to resist him, all right? So let me give you five thoughts when it comes to this subject, the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. First of all, look over at Job chapter 32. Job chapter 32, we're going to read the entire chapter. 
So the background before you, before we read Job chapter 32, Job had gone into his persecution from the devil. His wife forsook him. She didn't stand by him. He had four friends that came and sat with him in his affliction for seven days. They just sat and they didn't say one word. I don't know how many hours a day they sat with him, but the, the indication is they were with him all day. So they sat with him for seven days and didn't say a word. When they started speaking, the three of the four were older, and they just kept accusing Job, accusing Job, accusing Job, accusing Job. So finally, in chapter 32, the youngest of the four friends of Job decided to speak. Let's, let's, let's read it. So these three men ceased to answer Job, and here's why, because he was righteous in his own eyes. In other words, they accused Job, and he said, no, I'm, I'm, I've not done that. I've not done anything wrong. And he was trying to defend himself, right? Now watch this. Then was kindled the wrath of Elihu, the son of Barakel, the Buzite, of the kindred of Ram. Against Job was his wrath kindled because he justified himself rather than God. That was the one mistake that Job made. Verse 3, also against his three friends was his wrath kindled because they had found no answer, and yet they condemned Job. So in other words, they just made stuff up. Ah, this is why you're doing it. You know, they didn't find any answer, but they just said, we're going to condemn you. All right, let's continue. Now, Elihu had waited till Job had spoken because they were elder than he. When Elihu saw that there was no answer in the mouth of these three men, then his wrath was kindled. And Elihu, the son of Barakal, the Buzite answered and said, I am young, and ye are very old. Wherefore, I was afraid, and durst not show you mine opinion. I said, days should speak, and multitude of years should teach wisdom. He was saying, Brother Zach, you're really old. <laughs> and he was saying, you ought to talk first. But anyway, let's continue. Uh, now look at verse 8 carefully. But there is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. Great men are not always wise. Neither do the aged understand judgment. Therefore, I said, hearken to me. I also will show mine opinion. Behold, I waited for your words. I gave ear to your reasons. Whilst she searched out what to say, yea, I attended unto you. And behold, there was none of you that convinced Job or that answered his words. Lest ye should say, we have found out wisdom. God thrusteth him down, not man. Now he that hath not di directed his words against me, uh, neither will I answer him with your speeches. They were amazed. They answered no more. They left off speaking when I had waited, for they spake not, but stood still and answered no more. Watch this now, verse 17. I said, I will answer also my part. I also will show mine opinion for... I am full of matter. The spirit within me constraineth me. Behold, my belly is as wine which hath no vent. <laughs> Excuse me. It is ready to burst like new bottles. I will speak that I may be refreshed. I will open my lips and answer. Let me not, I pray you, Except any man's person, neither let me give flatteries, uh, flattering titles unto man, for I know not to give flattering titles. In so doing, my maker would soon take me away. All right, so here's point number one. Uh, write this down. A proper spirit gives you leverage when speaking. A proper spirit gives you leverage when speaking. All right, so here's Elihu the youngest of the four of the five. He's younger than Job and younger, younger, younger than his three friends. And so here's what he did, though. He said, my wrath is kindled. He goes, I'm upset right now. And he says, I'm going to tell you why I'm upset, because uh, Job justified himself rather than God. He goes, I'm upset with you three men because you found no answer, yet you condemned Job. Now, the spirit that he had was simply this. He said to them, he said, I said, days should speak and multitude of years should teach wisdom. He says, I gave you proper place. I respected you because you're my elders. And I'm not going to speak out of turn. And so he had an appropriate spirit. And he said, but there is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty uh, giveth them wisdom. And then he goes on, and he called them great men. But he said, you know, great men are not always wise. 
and neither do the aged understand judgment. And he, and he went on to just, uh, he says, I attended unto your words, and, and um, lest ye should say, you know, we have found out wisdom, God thrusteth them down, not man. And, and he went on to just talk about his spirit. And he goes down to verse 18. He says, for I am full of, of matter, and the spirit within me constraineth me. So uh, Elihu had the best spirit of all five men. Job's three friends and Job himself, Elihu had the best spirit of all five of them. And, and what happened was he was able to speak and he had leverage when he was speaking because he had a proper spirit. Now listen to me carefully. When you get attacked, when you have conflict, when you have criticism, when you have opposition, you make sure that you have the right spirit. Because if you have the right spirit, it will give you leverage. It'll help you in your stand. It will help you in declaring your position. It will help you greatly with, with um, the disputing. So guess what, though? If you have the wrong spirit, it ain't going to help you. If you have the wrong spirit, you may be right, but your wrong spirit will knock the legs out from under you. Sometimes when it comes to conflict, all we care about is what is right. And if all you care about is what is right, then that means this. You can be right, but you could have the wrong spirit. And if you have the wrong spirit, you being right, it's not going to matter to the, the person that's disputing with you. You need to have both, like Stephen had. You need to have the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Both are necessary. I think far too, for, 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 uh, far too long, again, we just concentrate on being right, and being right is easy. We know what right is by the Word of God. You just got to be able to read it. Got to be able to know where it's at, right? There, right there. This is what is right. But if our spirit is not proper, it doesn't give us leverage like it could if we had the right spirit. All right, number two. Look at Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4. Look down at verse number 10. Exodus chapter 4 and verse 10. Exodus chapter 4 and verse 10. Are you there? Exodus is the second book of the Bible. All right. Are you ready? It says, And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who makest the dumb, or deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. All right, number one, I said this. Where are we at? Here we go. Number one, a proper spirit gives you leverage when speaking. Number two, God is able to help you speak. Please don't forget this. God is able to help you speak. Now, I look at Moses. For 40 years, he was raised in Pharaoh's home. He had all the finest education that Egypt had to offer. There was, I mean, he was being groomed between him and uh Oh, it starts with an R. What's the other? Ramesses. We're vying, if you please, for the next Pharaoh. Now, I don't know that to be the next Pharaoh. I don't know that Moses was vying for it. But really, when Pharaoh passed away, it was going to be Ramesses or Moses. And I, I personally think the way things were going, Pharaoh would have preferred Moses over Ramesses. That's what I think. But nonetheless, it doesn't matter. He went 40 years in the backside of a desert. Because of he killed an Egyptian. And he went, he was banished, if you please, from Egypt for 40 years. He he went in hiding. And 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 God humbled him. But after 80 years of living, Moses got called of God out of the burning bush, and God says, I want you to go back to Egypt and say to Pharaoh, let my people go. Now, Moses, for whatever reason, said, Lord, I'm slow of speech. I don't know how to talk. My tongue's not very good. And I'm thinking, man, that's such a cop-out. 
You have 40 years of training before you're 40 years in the, in, in, uh, in, you know, in the wilderness, so to speak. And uh, you, 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 know what, you know how to talk. You're being groomed to be the next Pharaoh. What in the world are you talking about? But that was his position to God. He said, God, I can't do this. I don't know how to speak. And God said to Moses, don't you think I'm the one that made your tongue? Don't you think I'm the one that knows about every person on this planet? And I'm choosing you to be my spokesman. And then God said, he said to, he said to Moses, he said, I will, uh, let's see here. And he said, uh, he said, he said, we will go, oh, my soul. Where am I at? Exodus what now? Four. I'm in Exodus 10. Good grief. Exodus 4. And, um, and it says here, the Lord said unto him, uh, now therefore go and I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. Now, why is that in the Bible? The Bible says in, in uh, the New Testament, the whole Old Testament was written for our example, for our admonition. So God said to Moses, hey, I'll be with you. I'll tell you what to say. You just go on my behalf. Why did God put that in there? For our example. He'll do the same for us when we speak on his behalf. So when Stephen spoke, he had the wisdom and the spirit that they could not resist. God will do the same for you. You need to get close to God. God is able to help you speak. He is able to do it. You got to believe him. Again, I'm talking about your level, your personal conflict. No matter what it is, no matter what, you want the wisdom and the spirit. When, when disputes come, when conflict comes, when criticism comes, when opposition comes, no matter what it is, you want to have the same spirit and the same wisdom that Stephen had so that those that oppose you or dispute with you have no legs to stand on and they're not able to resist you. They just go away dumbfounded. So number one, a proper spirit gives you leverage when speaking. Number two, God's able to help you speak. You need to get a hold of him. You need to get close to him. Number three, write this down. The Holy Spirit can help you know what to say if you are yielded to him. The Holy Spirit can help you what to say, can help you know what to say, <laughs> if you are yielded to him. Now look at Matthew chapter 10 and verse 16. We're going to look at three different passages along this point. Matthew 10 will be the first one. Matthew chapter 10, and look at verse 16. Matthew chapter 10, and verse 16. Matthew chapter 10, and verse 16. Look what it says. Now these, all three of these passages are kind of prophetic passages, but I want, I want you to catch the application. Matthew 10, verse 16. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. All right, so as God sends us forth into this wicked world, we should be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Look at verse 17. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils. They will scourge you in the, their synagogues. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the, and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought, how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. All right, so again, this is a prophetic passage of, for, for, for those right there about the persecution they were going to go through in Israel. And he's talking to the disciples about, you know, when I leave, you're going to get persecuted, but I want you to know that the Holy Spirit will be with you. Don't worry about what you need to know to say. And it says, it's not you that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. Okay, look over at Luke. Luke chapter 12, please. Luke chapter 12. Oh, by the way, there's going to be so many strange things that happened to me uh, in <laughs> this whole thing. But I uh, had, had a man come to church this morning, and he was sitting out in the parking lot in his car. And I didn't know he was out there. I was in my office, and Miss Jessica Chavez went out there and, um, and was in the lobby. And he came up, and he had a bag full of books. And said, give this to your pastor. And, and he goes, well, who should I say gave? He goes, it doesn't matter. Just give it to him. And he walked away. He got in his car and drove off. And uh, so I got this book, uh, this bag full of books. And it was all, uh, 
Reformed doctrine, uh, Catholic and, and uh, Reformed theology, and it was like about a dozen books. And I guess he wanted to correct me on my position about women's clothing. And because uh, and he, he only gave it to me, gave it to me because of, of the articles that were written. And uh, so I just threw him in the trash. All right, what a blessing. Luke, I mean, I don't know who he is. I can't give him back to him. So I'm just like, whatever. I mean, just okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> I just threw him away, man. But anyway, Luke chapter, uh, uh, let's see here. Luke chapter number 12 and verse number 11. We're going to read 11 and 12. Look what it says. And when they bring you unto the synagogues and unto the magistrates and powers. Now we're talking about politics here. Take ye no thought how or what thing ye shall answer or what ye shall say. For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what ye ought to say. All right. Let's look at one more verse or passage. Luke chapter 21 and verse 12. Luke 21 and verse number 12. Luke 21 and verse number number 12. We're going to read down to verse number 17. Luke 21 and verse 12. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my namesake. Everywhere I look in the Bible, I see politics and government. Everywhere I look in the Bible, it, it's something we need to deal with. But anyway, let's continue. Um, and it shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it therefore in your hearts, not to meditate before what you shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist, and ye shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolk and friends, and some of you they shall cause to be put to death, and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. All right, so we see here that once again, a third passage where God says, I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. Okay, so the, the principle is this. Number three, the Holy Spirit can help you know what to say if you are yielded to him. Brother Howes, I told you this. All of all, 30 or 40 years of his pastoring, seven times a day he would pray to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I yield myself to you today. Please help me to cross, cross the paths of those whom Jesus would help if he were in my shoes. Seven times a day, he would pray a prayer like that. Holy Spirit of God, I yield myself to you today. Please help me to cross the paths of those whom Jesus would help if he were in my shoes. He prayed that prayer at 6 a.m. or right when he woke up. 9 a.m., noon, 3 p.m., 6 p.m. at night, uh, 9 p.m., and then at midnight or right before he went to bed, if he went to bed before midnight. Holy Spirit, I yield myself to you. Please help me to cross the paths of those whom Jesus would help if you're in my shoes. Now, you spend your life yielding to the Holy Spirit. Stop trying to get your way. Stop trying to get in the way of God. And let God work through you. And he'll give you the words to say when you need them. He really will. So number one, a proper, proper spirit gives you leverage when speaking. Number two, God is able to help you speak. He made your tongue. Number three, the Holy Spirit can help you to know what to say if you're yielded to him. Number four, we only got five points, so we're almost done. Look at Luke chapter 2. Turn, turn back to Luke chapter 2 and verse 41. Luke chapter 2 and verse 41. Now we're going to talk about Jesus now. Luke chapter 2. We're going to look at Luke 2 and Luke 4. And then I'll give you point number four. Luke chapter 2 and verse 41. Look what it says. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child, Jesus, tarried behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey. And they sought him among their kinfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him 
were astonished at his understanding and answers. Now remember, Jesus is 12 years of age right now. All right, turn over to Luke chapter 4, just two chapters over to the right. <sighs> Luke chapter 4, and look at verse 14. Now watch this. Now Jesus is 30 years of age. All right, so the passage we just read, he was 12. Now he's 30. Look at verse 14 of chapter 4. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. And there went out a fame of him throughout, through, through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went in to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. In the Bible times when they would read in the synagogue, they would pass scripture around. And one person would read a portion of scripture, another person would, would read, another person would read. And then they, they, it wasn't set up like churches now, but nonetheless, that's what they would do. All right, so let's continue. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. So they passed the scroll to him, Isaiah, and he opened it up, and it says this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is Isaiah 61, by the way. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? All right, point number four, write this down. <sighs> Speak with authority and grace. Speak with authority and grace. When, when uh, Jesus was 12 years of age, he was talking with the doctors. They were ask, he was asking them questions, and they were talking back and forth. And they were astonished at him. They were marveled. Whoa. Look at this 12-year-old boy. He is so profoundly wise. We've never seen anything like this before. And then when he was 30, he went back to the synagogue in Nazareth, as was his custom. That meant every Sabbath day, he would go to the synagogue. Now, either he would participate in the reading of the, of the text, or he would just listen. It doesn't really say what he did, but it, it said it was his custom. He grew up there, and he, he went to the synagogue every Sabbath day. And it was his turn to read. And he read Isaiah. And when he read it, he read it with authority. And then it says he, he had, they were marveled and saw, at the gracious words that came out of his mouth. So there are two things about Jesus when, it, when, it, when they were marveled by him is he read as one who had authority. Okay, let me, let me give you another verse. Look at John chapter 7. John chapter 7 and verse 45. I want you to see it. And then I'll, I'll say a few things and then we'll go to the point number 5. John chapter 7. Look at verse 45. John chapter 7. And look at verse 45. It says, then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto them, why have you not brought him? The officers answered, never man spake like this man. Woo! We have never heard anybody speak like him. Why? Because he spake with authority, and he spake graciously. Both. So when we speak, where does our authority come from? Somebody know? Where does our authority come from? From God and from his word. So as long as you speak, remember when you're being disputed, when you have conflicts, when you have opposition, don't, look, don't say, well, this is what I think. Because what you think may not have weight at all. Everybody has an opinion, like I've said often. Everybody has noses. Some are bigger than others. 
Some of your opinions are bigger than other people's opinions. It doesn't matter. Don't speak with your, th- with your opinion. Speak with authority. Speak with God and his word. Then, at the same time, be gracious. And that's exactly what Jesus did, and it's very similar to what Stephen did when it says he spake with authority, when it says he spake with the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. They couldn't resist him. All right, number one, a proper spirit gives you leverage when speaking. So, in other words, it's not just being right, it's how you present yourself. Number two, God is able to help you speak. Number three, the Holy Spirit can help you know what to say if you are yielded to him. Number four, speak with authority and grace. Number five, and last, if we speak on God's behalf, he will defend us. If we speak on God's behalf, he will defend us. Let me give you two verses to look at, two passages. Look at Acts chapter five, that's the first one. Acts chapter five and verse 38 and 39. Acts chapter 5, verses 38 and 39. You ready? No? Yes. Acts chapter 5, verses 38 and 39. Look what it says. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men and let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest happily ye be found even to fight against God. All right? So here's the disciples. They're speaking on behalf of God. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. Not only are they speaking the word of God, but they're speaking as the Holy Spirit leads them. So they're speaking on God's behalf. And God and, and this person said, hey, don't fight against these men, because if you fight against these men, you're going to be fighting against God, and you will not win. God will defend us if we speak on his behalf. Let's look at one more verse, Isaiah 54. Isaiah 54 and verse 17. Another familiar verse that we've read many times over the years. Isaiah 54 and verse 17. I've told you this before, but I keep... Two verses, or uh, I, I keep uh, one verse in my front pocket near my heart every every day of my life. I, I have some quotes, uh, and, 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 and oh, actually I have four verses, but this verse right here is right here on a three by five card, and I keep it next to my heart every day of my life. Isaiah fifty four verse seventeen: No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. All right, so God says every tongue that rises up against uh, us in judgment will be condemned. Why? Because we're the servant of the Lord, and our our righteousness is of God. So what this means is God's going to defend us. If we speak on his behalf, if you are his servant in whatever capacity you have to serve him, he will condemn everyone that, can, that, that criticizes you, that speaks in judgment against you. So we have this promise that if we speak on God's behalf, he will defend us. Um, I, um, I, this this lady and her husband or boyfriend, whatever, I don't know what they are, but um, they were speaking against me and uh, about this subject of women's apparel that the article was written about against me. And, and they were trying to tell me, you know, just all their arguments and stuff. So God gave me wisdom that I, I didn't even think about ever, ever until just that moment right then. And, and I said, do you know what happened when man sinned? in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve. I said, do you know what the first thing that God did after they sinned? The very first thing that that God did. They were like, I said, the first thing he did was he clothed them. They were naked. And the first thing God did was he slew an animal and made coats of skin 
and, uh, and put it on them. He said, wear this. And I said, guess what? He said, when they first sinned, they tried to cover themselves. They put fig leaves of aprons. And it wasn't good enough for God. And the first thing he said was, you sinned, you're naked, cover up. Get modest. First thing God did to fallen man. And boy, they couldn't say nothing against it. When I said that to that couple. And i would never said that before in my life. But the Holy Spirit of God put that in. That's, that's when they left the subject and went to Trump. <laughs> but, but I'm telling you something. God put that in my head. Now, there's all kinds of theological reasons for it. They tried to cover up their sin with fig leaves, and God said it's not good enough, and, and uh, blood had to be shed. But the fact of the matter is it was more than just blood being shed because there's nowhere else in the Bible where a man offered a, an animal sacrifice and then took the skin from that animal and put it on his clothes. Nowhere else in the Bible did it ever happen. The only time it ever happened was the Garden of Eden. So it wasn't just that, that, that blood had to be shed to make atonement for their sin. God also wanted them to be covered, cover up their, their nakedness. It's crystal clear. So here's the thing. If we speak on God's behalf, he will defend us. No questions asked. So what can we learn from Stephen when they were disputing against him? He had the wisdom and the spirit which they could not resist. They, they, he cut the legs out from under him. So as he was in the right position, wisdom, but he had the right, proper spirit. And because of the combination of the two, they couldn't, do, they couldn't say anything. So... The, the five points tonight, a proper spirit gives you leverage when speaking. Number two, God is able to help you speak. Number three, the Holy Spirit can help you know what to say if you are yielded to him. Number four, speak with authority and grace. Don't just speak with authority and just, this is what is right. No, speak with authority, but be gracious when you do it. That's what Jesus did. Number five, if we speak on God's behalf, we have the promise. He will defend us. No matter what they say. Now, the outcome, it could be that God delivers us. The outcome could be that we get stoned to death, like Stephen. But no matter what the outcome is, you know, Stephen got rewarded in heaven, by the way. I wouldn't mind dying a martyr's death if it was God's will for my life. I'll take that reward in heaven every day, as opposed to being a coward and wanting to live and not have to suffer for Jesus. So no matter what the outcome is, you know, Paul had his head cut off. God says he will not deliver me into the mouth of the lion. And God did deliver him, not, not physically, but boy, man, Paul, how revered is Paul now among all Christians because of what he went through. And I guarantee you his reward in heaven was great. God said, you ain't going to win, devil. You're going to defeat him physically, but you are not going to win, devil. Because Paul's going to, he's going to triumph over you. And God delivered him out of the mouth of the lion. So listen to me carefully now. Let's make sure that when we have conflict and opposition, that we have the wisdom and the spirit together. And they will not be able to resist. Let's pray. Father, thank